Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Torah Gems. I'm Rob, your host, and this week we're going to be talking about Kitetzi. Um, this week, uh, specifically, this, this tract of scripture speaks directly about something I speak about on a regular basis, basis, which is the attitude of the heart or the circumcision of the heart. This week we talk uh, from a couple of different tracts, which are very close to very close to how I'm going to start. Uh, this week's comments are just to read this particular uh, uh, tract of scripture. It starts in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 10. When you go out to battle against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands, and you take them away captive, and see among the captives a beautiful woman, and have a desire for her, and you take her as a wife for yourself, then you shall bring her home to her house, and she shall shave her head and trim her nails. She shall also remove the clothes of her captivity, and shall remain in your house, and mourn her father and her mother a full month. And after that you may go into her, and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. It shall be, if you are not pleased with her, then you shall let her go wherever she wishes. But you shall certainly not sell her for money, you shall not mistreat her you have humbled her. Now, in this particular tract of scripture, it's a simple rule and regulation for uh, the sons of Israel and how they are to relate to somebody they see that is quote-unquote pleasing to them. It seems, in a way, in our modern society, <laughs> to be, you know, almost prehistoric how they treat her, but What's really happening there? And what is it symbolic of? Well, it's symbolic, in, in my opinion, of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We know that there's a wedding coming up, and it's something that we look forward to. Um, one of the things that people who are quote-unquote messianics, whether, you know, blood Israel or adopted Israel, we are all Israel, uh, have in common is, is you know, we, we, we talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, how, you know, Yeshua, Jesus is going to come back, and for a bride without spot or wrinkle and what's that a euphemism for but you know a bride who has prepared herself and here we see that imagery of the woman you know they it's, it's symbolic of a vow but it's also symbolic of cleanliness it's also symbolic an outward symbol of an inward working okay and we see that picture here begin to start to take place a prophetic picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb, because who is the husband? It's it's Yeshua. And what is he going to do? He's going to find himself a bride without spot or wrinkle. You know, he came to set the captives free. What does it say? You know, it's, uh, and see among the captives a beautiful woman. See, Yeshua sees in us that beautiful bride. He sees something that has been purchased with his own blood, out of uh, something that, that he did that we could never do for us. Um, so, you know, we see that happening here, and we see that, that symbolism. It goes on to say, If a man has two wives, the, the one loved and the other unloved, and both of the loved and the unloved have borne him sons, if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then it shall be in the day he wills that he has his, what he has to his sons, he cannot make the son of the loved the firstborn before the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. To him belongs the right of the firstborn. We get into, you know, touching on a little bit of two-house theology, I guess. I say this all the time. My friend Daryl once said to me, he said, thank God God loves us because, despite our theology. And, you know, thank God God loves us despite our theology. <laughs> you know, and it's changing all the time, but, you know, there's the change that takes place under the strength of man in his own mind. And there's the strength of, cha of change that comes through the Ruach HaKodesh, the indwelling Holy Spirit, like it says in Ezekiel, you know, that he will cause us, the Spirit of God living inside of us ought to cause us to want to 
follow after and walk out the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God. You see, the fact of the matter is, is if we are doing this in our own strength, it's exhibiting an, an attitude of the heart that's wrong. Here we see the double portion. We see um, Jacob crossing the arms, you know, and then Ephraim. You see, the lesser of the two receives that double portion. However, one is not esteemed higher than the other. You see, in these last days, that there's a great ingathering happening, you know, and what God is speaking to my heart this week is, you know, the purging of those, of the harlotries, you know, that is continuing to happen. But it's the attitude of the heart, you know. Chapter 22 goes to how you're to treat things when people aren't looking. You know, if you see your neighbor's livestock wandering off, don't just ignore it. In other words, God is using the indwelling Holy Spirit and the Torah to train us to be more like what he would have us be. Okay? Right? So here we see that there is a rule and regulation set in place by God for us, but also the rule and regulation for God and what he endorses and what he doesn't endorse. Okay? So, you know, we come down and we see there's an outward symbolism of what's to happen. You know, we see the one of the rebellious son and in, you know, uh, Hebraic history, the rebellious son being stoned has never been carried out, you know? And we see that picture of purging evil from our midst. People say, oh, what a harsh God, you know? How could he want to kill someone for committing adultery? Our society has strayed so far from any sort of biblical moral model that we just endorse just about anything that comes down the path. That's the way it is. Like it or lump it, believe it or not, we continue to degrade any sort of morality. And people would point the finger at me and they would say, well, your reality isn't my reality. Well, you know, the human being was created with his heart set in eternity. You know, the Bible says that, you know, eternity is set in the heart of man. You know, the fact of the matter is, is we are constantly thinking about our creator, where we came from, where we're going, you know, regardless of religious affiliation, that is something that is common to all men, to all men. But what we do know and what we do understand is that there is a process that takes place and that God wants us to have circumcised hearts. He wants us to be like that bride who's willing to go through what it takes to prepare herself for the coming king. There's, it's not about getting into heaven because that's done. It's about having that heart because we love God. Because true love produces servitude. True love produces attitude of the heart that is willing to say, yes, God. You know, those old statements, you know, let go and let God, you know, let, let, let Christ be Christ, you know, these kinds of statements, you know. What's going to happen in the end days is going to happen. You know, things are going to take place that are going to test us. As a people, we're going through a time of testing now. Yeshua said, he who is faithful in a very little thing, period, 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 will be given authority over much. So, we need to be faithful. We need to be expected. And we need to be willing to be proven that we are seeking after God. You see, it's not man-made concepts. They're God-made concepts. Midrash, God-made concept. You know, argument, man-made concept. Sin board concept. You see, that's where it's at applying Torah to in our families, applying Torah in our lives, applying Torah to situations of unforgiveness and bitterness, and, and being able to work through it. It's not something that needs to be a self-help book cooked up by some man who says he's been empowered by the Holy Spirit and yet doesn't follow the Constitution. My friends, Yeshua did not die on the cross so we could have a bacon sandwich. That's cheap grace. Yeshua died on the cross to give us in his inheritance, the commonwealth of Israel, the Torah of God. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.